This is Gareth Jones on Speed with Gareth Jones. Hello. Zog. Hello. Sarah Leach. Hello. Richard Porter. Hello. And Ted Kravitz. Oh God, not again. Hello and welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed, a full complement of four of us around the microphone. We're going to need to get a bigger room really, aren't we? I need a, a bigger house. And I think it's a good idea having all of us here because after the long winter of no racing, F1 is back, which is a huge relief to those of us who are addicted to it. Sarah, are you an addict? Are you addicted to F1? <laughs> I do enjoy it. It's good to watch. How long have you been watching F1? Did you watch it as a kid? Yes, uh, no, no. Uh, you know what? My dad used to watch it all the time when Ed and Senna was racing and I didn't know why he just kept watching it and go around and around in circles. But then, now I kind of understand. But he used to race cars, so I suppose I got it off my dad. You love watching people go round and round in circles, Richard, don't you? I can't think of anything better. Um, I should have put a bit more oomph into that, I realise. No, it sounded yeah. sarcastic. You, sound, you sounded pretty keen there. You know, we've talked about this on the programme before. I kind of lost a bit of love for F1 last year. I just couldn't be bothered. Just because life was getting in the way. You know, I have two small children and other stuff on. So has that first race kind of reinvigorated it? Well, here's the thing. Do you know what's reinvigorated it for me is... I think more than anything, the single thing that's reinvigorated it is that Netflix documentary about Formula One. Yes. (laughs) Because it's really, really good. And it got me really jazzed about F1, which I presume is the intention. Because it focuses on people and you realise that they're sort of more three-dimensional than you ever get a sense of in the actual F1 coverage. Mm -hmm. Where you just see them being interviewed going, for sure, the car was pretty good this time. Mm. When you realise that they're human beings and they have human failings and frailties and that they really do care and there's a lot of passion there and you see also the people behind the scenes. I mean, Gunther Steiner alone is worth it, watching that Netflix. A single thing is called Gunther Steiner! Yeah, Sorry, that was very loud, wasn't it? He's got a swearing problem. He's got yes. a swear... No, he's yeah. got no it's problem swearing at all. absolutely amazing. <laughs> he really <laughs> manages to swear very yeah, no, easily. It is yeah. very good. I he's do an like... Italian with a German accent as well. Yeah. Yes. Which is yeah. weird. I had to look into this because I said on Twitter, I said something about him being Italian and loads of people went... Um, <coughs> I think you'll find he's not Italian. Really? And I had to go, no, he is. Yeah. Or as he would say, he f***ing is. <laughs> and, <laughs> but he's from the very top bit of Italy, right by the border yeah, with, with Switzerland and Austria. And so he's it's got quite a Germanic... Yeah, 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 yeah. I went up there. I was up there last summer on holiday. And it's a really good bit of Italy because you get... All of Italy's hotel, good. I know, Italy's fantastic. But the thing yeah. is, if you stay in a hotel up sort of towards the Swiss border, it's run like a Swiss hotel very well. Mm-hmm. But the food's but as good as an Italian nice hotel. Nice combination. Italian Perfect. prices, Perfect. not Swiss prices. Yeah, exactly. Is... So it's great. So Gunther Steiner, that's the thing. Sort of passionate like an Italian, but ordered like someone from a more Germanic nation. It's a good racing combo, I think. So you've watched the Netflix documentary? I haven't, it, no, because no, I, I was away last week and I haven't caught up on all You the were in Switzerland, actually. I was, in fact, in Switzerland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's called... Race to Survive or something? I forgot. Drive, Drive to Survive. Drive to Survive. Is a terrible title. It was, it was that, yeah, really there was a, show. yeah, there's a little bit of upheaval about the name of that show. Really? Yeah, a couple of people expressed their feelings that they were promoting the series as the dangers of F1 and how dangerous it is and all this stuff, when yeah. actually there's more to the sport than just going a million miles an hour and just surviving. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. putting their lives at risk every week, whereas you say, Richard, there's all the characters involved and the stories to tell. And I really enjoyed that about the series too i've only managed to watch the first episode but in watching the first episode it's great that they're going from character to character to character and everyone has their own story and they play their own part and they play their integral role in their team i like the audio treatment that's what i've noticed about it the way that they ramp up the effects and they've added effects you can hear every time a car touches the wall it's Yeah, yeah. But it actually really yeah. works. It's cinematic, isn't it's it? Very, it is. It's very Hollywood. Mm. I love the way it's been shot, just the way the camera moves from the back of the car to the front of the car. It's, it's been really well It's uh, shot well, produced, yeah. But yeah, yeah. The, the DOP must be very good. But you know what would make it better? And also I think would probably make your show, The Grand Tour, better as well, Richard, if they turned up the colour saturation a little bit. Because <laughs> I don't think there's enough colour in neither of those two programmes. Is this not your screen, so, maybe? Yeah, I, I don't know. 
to check your settings. Yeah, I think you you'll we did find, have, as it's called in the TV, the grade. The, yeah, the and final the colour thing grading. Where people do this. Someone, it's, it's a job in itself. Someone yeah, comes in quite and plays with all the levels and makes the colours pop, as yeah. they say. And makes everything consistent from scene to scene. Mm, I mean, you might be used to your advertising is very poppy with their colours. Yeah. Mm. But film, yeah. they make it a bit more blue in colour. Blue and make orange is always a stuff they bring out in films, isn't it? It's a murky blues or pingy oranges. Yeah, pingy orange. Sure, it's a shame this isn't on video. You've got a pingy orange jumper on, actually. Okay. The rest of us are dressed up. We're off to a bloody funeral. Look at us. <laughs> I probably do love my go orange. to funeral and trainers. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, Richard. Go on. Yeah, we had a grader on the Grand Tour who at one point got so giddy with riding all the different levels and things that he could do that he made some grass in the background blue at which point the director had to go, just knock it off, mate. <laughs> I think he actually went, he came out of the thing and went, I think that guy might be colour blind. He thinks well, grass is blue. Back during your Top Gear days, there was quite a lot of graduated tinting, I think, going on. Oh, my God, the vignetting. Quite, yeah. It, was where they, it got to the point where I actually said something. Cause Red normally, you know, skies. The, no, it was not that. It's where they it's put the to, sort of... The the Michael Bay. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then the top, often top right corner, then has a sort of black fuzz across it. I'm not yeah. explaining it very well, but you know what yeah. I mean there. And it was getting lower and lower and lower. <laughs> And I'd normally stay out the editing thing unless there's something that's very prevalent. And I'll bring up something else in a minute that's relevant to that Netflix doc. But I, there was a point at which I was talking to someone in the edit and I went, could you just knock off the vignetting? It's like watching the show from a f- bin shelter. You're going, I can't, I feel like I've got a, a can my head down. I'm missing something. I'm in a pillbox here. What's happening? I mean, yeah. the, the vignette was half the bloody screen. Yeah. And they stopped, they knocked that off. It was agreed that this was getting a bit silly. But... One of the things that also started happening in the edit in Top Gear days was they started putting extra sounds on stuff. And that's fine, but it's actually got to the point where it's driving me nuts because it was things like you'd see, you want the presenter to go, and if you push this button here, and they'd put like a Hollywood... Like a voo. Voo, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd just yeah. go... Look, Stop it's it. a Renault Clio. Anyone who owns a Clio knows that it doesn't do that mm-hmm. when you press the button. I know you're trying to make it all dramatic, but it's just It's a bit naughty stupid. if you're... Yeah. Well, yeah. similarly, have so, you watched Blue Planet or any of that? Oh, I mean, yeah. it's loaded with effects which don't actually happen. Well, yeah. okay, but- loaded! It, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with I'm guilty of that using sound effects to yeah, yeah. tell a story for doing it in the right way. I mean, adding, let's say, crunching effect when an yep. insect is eating a leaf... Mm. Yeah, and that's probably okay. If, uh, I mean, ideally, you take the actual sound and amplify it and process, it and you kind of do something with the original sound and bringing it out more. But if you're adding kind of a crazy sci-fi sound of extra every button push, that yeah, you're, it's just annoying. You're telling a different well. story. You're, yeah. you're lying. But that's the thing. The F1 show they have, as Gareth said, you know, they've added some stuff, and you know, even when cars ride the curbs, they <laughs> amped up the. <laughs> yeah. Wait, but that is a But it's really it's good. good. It just I, I, thought, I find it annoying, but actually, I love the way it heightens everything. And then I mm. saw actual IndyCar champion Dario Franchitti on Twitter saying that he thought the Netflix doc captured the sensations of being a racing car driver better than anything he'd ever seen. No, I saw that. That. And he, he said the in-car was more vivid yeah. than anything else that he's ever seen. And I thought, well, if it's good enough for him, mm. I'm down with that. It's great. Honestly, Zoggy, you should no, I, have a watch. I'm really looking I got so hooked on it. I've got one way. left and I'm almost saving it because I don't wow. want it to end. But I got so hooked suits? on the first few. <laughs> yeah. Why is it with suits? <laughs> I was addicted to suits. I know, because I, I know I a few people who are addicted to suits, and I've never seen it. But that's the Meghan Markle one, right? Yeah, the Meghan Markle one. Man in the High Castle, that's where it's at for me at the moment. In summary, yeah. though, Richard, you're back on F1 this year. Netflix I'm, has made it happen. I've become a bit jazzed for F1, and I didn't watch the first race live, but I did watch the highlights, and I watched qualifying highlights, and I'm down with it. My cool. oldest so son, Tycho, said to me when he saw the Netflix documentary, Dad, it's great, but... The whole first show was telling me stuff that I already know about. And so that's because the purpose of the Netflix documentary is to win people over to F1 who aren't F1 fans. This is Liberty trying to reach mm. out. Can and I say reach what? out? Yeah. Going forward, Do they're trying to reach now. out said, to a new audience. Did Liberty produce the show? Who produced they the show? They authorised the show. Yeah. They gave it's permission a, for the show. It's a production yeah. company that's doing it. Yeah. Sean Patches hey. is one of the exact producers. So, yeah, Liberty right. Yeah, okay. right, so they are right involved in the production. With it. Okay. I thought they walked a fine line between trying to make it accessible to people who don't know anything about F1 without making it so dumb and insulting to people who do that you'd turn it off. That's one of the things that makes it so good is that I think they have, they've got that balance balance right right. most Mm -hmm. of the time. There's very little of it where they go, and this is called a car. (laughs) Yeah, it was close. (laughs) Well, interesting that it got referenced a few times in the coverage on Sky. They mentioned the documentary. Now, you don't mention other programmes when you're a broadcaster. Uh, 
uh, now, funnily enough, you do if your Channel 4's F1 coverage. This Unless year. you're told to. A part of their deal is that they, they say, now we'll have highlights uh, tomorrow, but yeah. if you want to watch it live, it's on Sky. Yeah. And it sounds really weird because yeah. you yeah. never normally get reluctantly going. Like, gritted okay. teeth. Yeah. <laughs> part of the deal. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. cannot mention other channels unless you are required to. Unless it's so part it, of the deal. Yeah, exactly. So it's clear that this. Netflix documentary is part of the Liberty programme to relaunch F1. Does hey, anyone know? Sorry, Gareth. Mm. But does anyone know if they've got crews embedded with the teams again this season? I hope so. I hope you so. You know, they, yeah. they do. They, they do. do? Yeah, 100%. Yep, oh, cool. And uh, what about Ferrari and Mercedes declines uh, to take part last I'm not year. sure, but I, you know what? I read that the only reason Mercedes wasn't taking part was because Ferrari wasn't. So they thought, oh, right. we're not doing it either. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. I thought you were going to say know. the only reason they weren't taking part is because the email just went straight to Toto Wolf's junk folder and he sort of collatedly <laughs> goes, what? Everyone else is doing a documentary? Oh, that would have looked really good. Because it does. I don't think there's any yeah. downside. You know, ultimately the team's come out of it they haven't stitched them up. They must have had so many no, hours of footage. I mean, particularly yeah. if Sean Baptist is across it, yeah. you know, you'll be signing them off. So you wouldn't want them to come across in a bad light. Yeah, he's going to protect his brand. Toto's not very good at swearing, though, so he's not he going to I'm come across very well. Very well. <laughs> yeah, he back. does. I'm back. He does say that. <laughs> hey, let's talk about this F1 season that's finally got underway. It was actually... Great timing, this documentary on Netflix. There's a build-up to F1. It definitely helped. Well, I presume, I mean, that's entirely deliberate, but also I was just watching it thinking they must have had so much footage. Mm. I would struggle to believe they could have had it ready much sooner anyway because it must have been a massive edit job. I I remember seeing some of the crews during last year's coverage. but Yeah, but the race. I want to run down qualifying with you guys, right? So we're going to do it like they do on the television. After qualifying for the Australian Grand Prix, in 20th position it was Robert Kubica in the Williams. And 19th place you've got George Russell from Williams. 18th, Carlos Sainz from McLaren. And 17th, Pierre Gasly in the Red Bull. Uh, was he? Oh God, that's not very good. Lance Stroll in his dad's car, racing point at 16. Daniel Kvyat, he's come on in his return season in 15th place. 14th, Antonio Giovinazzi in the Alto Romeo. Actually, I think it's first Giovinazzi, uh, if I'm Giovinazzi, okay. Mm. 13th is, according to this, Lexander Albon. <laughs> <laughs> As he's known to his mates. Sorry, I need a new keyboard. uh, In the other Toro Rosso, he's in 30. Number 12, this should be Sarah doing this. In fact, Sarah, you do 12. Go on, go on. Number 12, it's the Australian. (laughs) General Ricardo. In a Renault. In a Renault. Don't laugh, yeah. 11, Nico Hulkenberg, Renault. 10th, Sergio Perez in the fast of two racing points. Ooh, at 9th, it's Kimi Raikkonen in the Alfa Romeo. It's a Zerba. And Lando Norris in 8th place in his debut in the one qualifying. Seven, Kevin Magnussen in the house. The other house at number six with Roman Groschel. At five, Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari. Fourth, Matt Verstappen, Red Bull. Third, that's Sebastian Vettel in the Ferrari. And the second place, Valtteri no messy Bottas in the Mercedes. And on pole, Lewis Hamilton from Great Britain. Mercedes. Well, he says he's from Great Britain. He sounds like an American to me. So- <laughs> talking American, wasn't he? <laughs> All the time. I was like, what is that? He's been doing it for years, honestly. Yeah. So, OK, Richard, let's talk about the stuff that we mentioned in the last show relative to that, right? Mm. First of all, one of the things I said in the last show was that Annie Bradshaw maintained mm-hmm. that Sergio was going to be out-qualified at least by Lance Stroll. Did it happen? Suck it up, Bradshaw. <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> and also, well, I thought that the Alfa Romeos were going to be right up there as possibly the third team. Not mm, quite, because Haas, no, Kevin Magnussen, Richard, you said was good for putting shells, got it to seventh in that yeah. Haas. No, fair enough. Yeah. Haas again, generally yeah. looking pretty yeah, tidy, yeah, early the, doors. The top of the middle sector. Again, a good, solid start to the season for Haas. Yeah, I mean, they're knocking on the door of the top end. Really, they're more than middle sector now, I'd, well, judging in terms of qualifying. Have you noticed, or did you notice, and I don't know if this is prevalent on Sky as well, but you know F1 likes a bit of lingo and likes a new little buzz phrase. There's a new one that I've not heard before, and David Coulthard said it relentlessly on the Channel 4 coverage, mid-grid. Mid-grid. Top of the mid-grid. Top of the mid-grid, yeah. So I was like, has he yeah, thought like of that? that? Yeah. Maybe he's thought of that and he's really pleased with it. He's himself. coined it. No, he's top, of the, top, of top of the middle picking order. Yeah, it's going to drop down into the mid-grid. Into the mid-grid. The biggest impression I had actually from, from qualifying was that uh, up from. the new boys, just how strong 
a lot of the newcomers were. I mean, not just in terms of qualifying position, because Lando Norris, very good qualifying in the McLaren, but the attitude of the young guys, of Leclerc, of Russell, Norris, you know, they sounded like proper racing drivers, confident. You know, Leclerc was disappointed not to have beaten Vettel. Correct. You know, yeah. mm. he wasn't happy that put in a good sort of performance. He was disappointed that he hadn't beaten Vettel. Well, you know what happens when these young guys make it into F1? I know Leclerc's had a season previously. When they get into F1, this is the first time that they haven't been the leader in their category. All three of those guys have led the championships or won it in two of the three cases of those three. And for them, no wonder they're going to be disappointed. And quite right, they, these are the people exactly so that you want, yeah, yeah. You want in F1. Can we give a small round of applause for Lando Norris, who yeah, was eighth, well eighth in that rotten old McLaren? <laughs> Woohoo! And I'm quite pleased that he's better than the Saints are coming. The Saints are coming. Carlos Saints is coming. Because I don't think Saints is all right. I think he's very good, but I don't mm. think he's great. And if Lando can be quicker than Saints, brilliant. Good on him. He's got funny eyes, though, Lando Norris. <laughs> funny eyes. Well, it works for a lazy eye. No, they're, just he looks like working. he's going to kill you. They're working OK, though. Whatever's funny with them, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was also, this past weekend, wearing a cap that he looked like he'd borrowed off his dad. <laughs> like, <laughs> not in terms of the design, but it was just, it looked too big for him. Oh, right. He's got, like, his older brother, Small maybe. Head. I'll borrow your cap. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, it's really cool. No, it doesn't. It's too big for you. No, no, no. It's like going okay. over his ears. Okay. There have been a few changes to F1 this year, and I think we'll save the discussion of what they are for the next part of the show. Hey, welcome to F1 Headquarters. Why don't you uh, come through? Thank you. Before we go upstairs, can I get you a, a coffee or a cup of tea? Oh yes, that'd be nice. Cup of tea, please. Coming right up. Take sugar? Uh, yeah, one, please. No problem. There you go. Can I ask, does everything make a lot of noise here? Oh, yeah. It's been like this since we've been on Netflix. Hold on, I'll call the elevator. It's all very loud! You kinda get used to it after a while. Actually, before we go upstairs, do you mind if I nip to the bathroom? Uh, no, I actually prefer it if you didn't. There have been some changes to F1 for 2019. Some you might describe as being important, others less so. Perhaps the least important one, I love this, Richard, was that Pirelli have worked on the release agent that they put on the tyres when they come out of the mould. It's the moulds as well, isn't it? They're called chrome moulds now. Chrome mm. moulds. Chrome moulds, yeah. So the tyres are now shiny. Mm. And they look like they won't have any grip. Yeah, they do, yeah, And then they scrub yeah. down, don't they? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. They look like American tyres. American wheels and Indy cars always look yeah, glossy, yeah. don't they? Yeah. They're taking a leaf out of their book. Can I pause at this point to shamelessly plug my Sniff Petrol 2019 uh, Grand Prix really? guide, yes. which I wasn't going to do this year. I did one in 2017, and it was meant to be an e-book, and then lots of people said, could I have a physical one? And it's all done through Amazon Print On Demand, so you can do this. But it was never formatted to look like a book, and it was awful that it was printed out. I mean, the formatting was terrible. This time round... I wasn't going to do one, and then I'm writing a proper book, also about F1, and it was going so well, I had a bit of a rush of blood to the head and went, oh, screw it, I'll do the F1 guide. I've got spare F1 thoughts, I'll put them in a book. So I sort of spent a week just furiously writing this, to the extent I gave myself backache, because I was so sort of hunched over the keyboard, <laughs> bad posture. But I did get this book done, and it's like 90 pages of just drivel. The reason I bring this up now is because, first of all, I want to implore people to buy it, because 
because it helps pay your bills. Yeah, I mean, it, it won't ever be. It it's would be no more living. than a shoes changing amount of money. But yes, yeah, so if you would just buy it, it make me feel better about having a deranged week of almost killing myself trying also, to. Also, it's pretty good. No, it looks all right it, printed it out. You can get an ebook. Yeah, you have to go to Amazon. Go to Amazon in your country. But it's not How much is it, Richard? It's five ninety nine in British pounds. That's for, no, it's not. No, no, but it's not. What am I no? talking about? It's four ninety nine in British pounds oh, under a fiver. Richard, what's for the funniest part? Book. Can you um, give us an example? Or my favourite bit is the spoof column by Gunther Steiner okay. based on the Netflix. Could you doc. read us a little snippet? Gareth can read it in his Gunther I'm Steiner. Gunther voice. Steiner. But Gareth, you like to write. Oh, there's the other one. I'll tell, I'm quite proud of this. There's an introduction to F1 by a made-up American sports reporter called Kenny Sporlman. <laughs> Go on, read it. From, Go on. Uh, right. Hey, sports fans, Kenny Sporlman for KYWXZ's Drive Time Sports, coming hard in your car across the Quad County area. <laughs> so here's a little something new for you, and it's awesome European-style auto racing series called Formulation One. <laughs> Do you know what the funny thing about this is? Obviously, I'm not saying it's funny, but if you try and explain how F1 works in a way that perhaps an American sportscaster would, it starts to sound mad. It starts to sound ludicrous. <laughs> because It's a good thing, though, isn't it? Well, it sort of is, but you kind of go, is this sport, in fact, absolutely nonsensical? <laughs> I mean, I, I know it it's is. It's like the Texas Grand Prix sport when they got that boxing sense. guy to go, and in the blue corner. Oh, exactly, yeah. the introduction. <laughs> yeah, that was embarrassing. That was yeah, they haven't done that again, though. But no, they haven't. No. Yet. I, was, I thought I might. I was trying to be a bit of Rasmus House. Okay. Yeah, right. Go on, yeah I just described this as Formula One takes place over 21 games, sometimes called Grand Prix. <laughs> and these occur all across the world in places as exotic as England, Italy, Australasia, China and Great Britain from March through December. <laughs> Each race battle occurs across a series of days, beginning with some unregulated practice throws on Friday, leading to the solo racing speed trials upon Saturday. <laughs> these occur across three quarters, the first of which involves all 20 players engaged in a sprint-style sudden death match against the countdown clock <laughs> and, and so it goes on and then there's a Gunther Steiner column based on his appearances in the Netflix doc right. which is Amazing. about him but it's got loads of swear words oh it. my god you have to bleep them okay I can't rest with Kreider enough you've got to really rest with him you got to be Gunther Steiner oh my god I don't get me started on that Roman Groschen that kid is a pain in my all the time don't ask me again he's like the f***ing dish on the f***ing Fish! Jesus Christ! Okay, listen, I'll explain this to you. I think that's probably oh, the flavour of it. Richard, this is... Should we wash down the microphone? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry about that. <laughs> Clearly the funniest tome ever on the so subject of... I was just going to... Oh, sorry, I won't read out my own work. It's incredibly self-indulgent. I, I you We started talking about tyres, and I was going to say... So I, I thought, I'll explain... The new system of tyres, not the chrome moulds, but this oh, three yeah. colours. Yeah, did you hear Mark Brandon say five. on Sky? He's like white powder, butter, and jam. Exactly. No, oh, really? Can you <laughs> take that from your book? Oh, no, because no. No, that's better than this. Oh. What did you um, say? I was trying to explain it in a way that's deliberately confusing. Oh, good. Because I'm, I'm an idiot <laughs> like that. You. So the new system to come up with simplified charge for 2019. Gone is last year's rainbow lineup of seven confusing options and in comes a new, more straightforward system in which the teams have a choice at any given race of just three tyres, soft, medium, hard, wet and intermediate. This means there'll be no more super soft or ultra soft, except, of course, when there is. <laughs> and, and it goes on in that vein. Because you know what? I was trying to work this out and I genuinely tied yeah. my brain in a knot going... Right, so a C2 could be a hard or a medium, but a C3 could be a medium or a hard or a soft, whereas yep. a C4 could be yeah. a soft or a medium. Depending on the race, yeah. yeah. And a C5 yeah. could only ever be a... So, wait, no, wait, hang on, what? Because yeah. uh, yeah. that, that could be a red or a yellow, but never a white, but it could be a... Um, yeah. Anyway, well, I, 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 I think it's ultimately more I straightforward. Was I was just being book, so bloody minded. IndyCar, prime and option. Yeah. That's it. Sort mm. it out. Mm. It's got to be simple. Make it simple. To recap, the tyres are shiny and please buy my book. Well, I was going to say, that book, funniest thing you'll ever read on the subject of Grand Prix, apart from Williams's strategy for 2019. But I have a complaint, Richard, about your book. Mm. The cover. What? I know that is Sniff Petrol Corporate Orange. Yes. And I know you've added the blue to it, that pale sky blue, because it works well with the orange yes. in a golf kind of way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not an F1 colour, I think. You'll find that's a WEC colour, but we will allow it for that. It's a beautiful cover. Oh. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was yes. more about just using my corporate orange and then yeah. it looked too plain as like white orange. above it, so it's blue. We will forgive you. So we've got shiny tyres, we've got three compounds instead of 804, and we've got Matteo Binotto, I forgot his first name, Matteo, Matteo, Matteo. Spino Matteo. Matteo. Oh, Matteo yeah. Binotto. Yeah. The new Ferrari guy. Who is Where's Wally? Wouldn't you like to do a Where's Wally with him? It's those black glasses, he looks exactly like Where's Wally. You could do a whole panic and have Matteo in there. Where's Matteo? I said to my wife when we were watching the coverage, and I said he looks like a character actor playing a quirky person in a Tim Burton.
Burton movie. Ah, uh, yeah. With the hair and the glasses, you kind of go, right, you've been in hair and makeup for a bit for that, haven't you? You don't look like that in real life. That's just like a character you're doing. You're doing a bit here. In costume. The race. Do you know who I felt most sorry for during the race? Ricardo, for losing his oh, wing so early on? That was, was dreadful. It wasn't here, but we've got to talk about this. Apparently he drove out onto the there. grass. There was concrete yeah. or something under the grass. There was a gummy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it, yeah. So. It just, Interesting point on that. Somebody said, why did they not spot this when they walk the track? Mm-hmm. And it was pointed mm-hmm. out that the drivers and their mechanics will leave the pit through the pit exit walk the track when they get to the pit entry they walk back in there they don't don't walk down the start finish straight and they're only out on there when they're getting the car ready well his car wasn't being prepared near there you'd never spot it so he was oblivious to that he probably knew every other divot and rut around the rest of the track but that gully that knackered his car didn't know it was there otherwise he wouldn't have gone there I guess yeah he was also probably a bit unlucky that his car ran over it in just the right way to take the yeah. wheel off so he's you know, it, I'm yeah. Daniel Ricciardo downstairs what the <laughs> hell oh, no, not a gully <laughs> honestly it couldn't have been worse you must have been in tears Sarah at that <laughs> moment as an Australian I really felt for him she's never had a good result no. in Australia has it was it? a bit gut wrenching but he said himself the whole week was a bit of a paparazzi showdown for him because he just did so much. He tried to please everybody and the only one that he didn't please was himself. So I think maybe he felt he didn't prepare well. But, I mean, that could have happened to anyone. Mm. Preparing well by walking the start-finish straight. Yeah, uh, maybe yeah, yeah. instead of doing all the media promos for the Australian public, you could have walked the track. But the person who I <laughs> felt most for at that race wasn't Ricardo, and I did have a real pang of ouch when that mm. happened, is actually Mr Estebanacom. Esteban Ocon. Oh, yes. Yes. Who spent the entire race standing next to Toto going, I could have done better than that, I could have done better than that. It's the hand of the king now, isn't he? Just uh, standing next to him going, would it please you, my lord, if I... (laughs) If I said, well done, Lewis, well done, Valtteri. He's, yes. Yeah. It is a bit of a travesty that he's not there. He's a great driver, yeah. but he's there to sort of prove that he could do better, but I don't think he could have done better than Valtteri or Lewis this time round. I think that's well, no, what I mean, he would have felt. I mean, Valtteri clearly pulled something quite extraordinary out of the bag there because straight after the race when he was interviewed, it looked like he was stunned. He didn't seem to understand how he'd managed to do that. I think the anger of last year just built up and built up and built up. Did you hear what he said at the end? Yes. To whom it may concern. Can we quote that now? He said, to who it may concern, (laughs) f*** you. (laughs) The eternal wingman, bridesmaid, he was there, yeah. I think he was was thumbing through that Gunter Steiner quotes book. Is that what it was? was? (laughs) Ah. He didn't know. The last race he won was finale of 2017. Really? Yeah, yeah, he didn't win anything last year, did he? Yeah, he didn't win one race. I reckon he's actually Valtteri Bottas from the Mirror Universe. Yeah, I think he went back in the off-season. We've got Evil Bottas. Well, it's, it's Evil so Bottas. He's he turned, yeah. he, yeah. he turned yeah. into Rocky. He started running, yeah. doing all his weights. Yeah? He's, hey, yeah. do you know bad this about Bottas? Bad, badass Bottas, yeah. <laughs> Interesting little bit of trivia about Bottas particularly. You know they've changed the rules this year about the weight of the car. The driver is now measured separately. Yeah. And if you're a lower weight driver, then ballast the car. It basically means that slightly heavier drivers yeah, are it's not less, a, less disadvantaged. Exactly yes. that. Yeah, yeah. And as a result, Bottas has started eating more and eating huh. better because he can, because he doesn't have to worry so much about his weight. And he said over the winter he got ill less and he feels better because he's eating properly. Oh. So maybe that's the secret. He was malnourished before because he's quite a big guy. I mean, I've, I've, yeah, yeah, broad shoulders. Yeah, broad shoulders. Yeah. He's a yeah. stockier yeah. guy. Yeah. He's, he's quite mm. little, but he's With the, There were genuine yeah. health concerns about drivers having to lose yeah. something like 10 kilos over the winter yeah. under the previous rules. And, yeah, we joke about him being malnourished. It's not far from the truth. Well, it's like, yeah, if you're hungry, you can't concentrate properly and you get yeah. grumpy. Or no. I do, anyway. It's I mean, just... some of them just look, look like waifs. It's like they're so thin. It's <laughs> Little buttons. Like, yeah. Yeah, mm. Little buttons. I'm sorry to go on about the Netflix doc again, but there's some sequences in that of showing different drivers training. And some of the training regimes, the weightlifting and things that they do, you know, there's always that thing where they wrap a kind of strap around their heads and oh, yeah. tie it to weights and they, they rock back forth to work the neck muscles. Yeah. But there's one with, um, uh, I can't remember, I think it, I can't remember which driver it is, but he's doing sort of, if you imagine grabbing onto a bar and doing pull ups, but he's doing it horizontally 
and sort of doing pr- like press ups on a bar while his trainer holds his legs. Ooh, that's cruel. And I was looking at it and going, what is the point of that? And I was thinking, oh, you've got to be so strong to do that. Mm. Yeah. He's straight as a plank. You just go, that's <laughs> no, some are. higher level stuff going yeah, on there for training. You know, that's super fitness, isn't it? We talk about how Bottas is obviously, you know, we've got a new Bottas this year. Looks like he's a change man. He's clearly pulled something. Yeah, exactly. Change man. But that said, I can't help thinking that Bottas winning the first race means Lewis is winning the championship. I know that seems a little unfair to Bottas, but Bottas is a different Bottas than he was last year. Well, he's allowed to back I up Haribo on the car I don't think he's going to beat well, Lewis so. over the season, though. <laughs> well, there may be mitigating circumstances as to why Lewis was unable to keep pace, match pace, with oh, Bottas. Apparently the four of his of four. car. Exactly, yeah. Because yeah. 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 clearly Lewis's car was quicker, or Lewis in his car was quicker than Bottas in qualifying. But when it came to the race, that part of the floor that was damaged on the left-hand side ahead of the rear wheel had a big enough influence on the car that Lewis's back end was loose and he couldn't maintain speed in the exits of corners yeah, yeah. you know what floor schmore <laughs> give, give Bottas his moment oh no no yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. I just, oh, no know, it was I, terrific I, to see him I, I hope, and, you know all credit to him he deserved yeah. that win he said he went away did a lot of mental training over the winter so I think he sort of got quite disturbed by everybody's feedback last year and he went away and made himself and into I a love tough him. man. Yeah, I love he, all the finished drivers. Yeah. He's demonstrated, he's shown that he can do it. You yeah. know, he's, yeah, all credit to him. To be fair, in the last show, when we were talking about what we expected from this season, I said, oh, it'd be great for Leclerc go ahead of Vettel and I want Lewis to win it. I didn't mention Bottas and fair play, he's come in under the radar and if the Ferraris aren't as quick as they appear to be so far and we get a proper internecine battle between the two, it'll be great. Someone's going to have to clip a bit off Lewis's floor for the rest of the season. Though. But also, just on that point, the Ferraris, you know, all the sort of coverage, the post-race analysis was all going, oh, a disaster for Ferrari. It's like, they did all right. They just yeah. worked faster than the Mercedes. Yeah. But yeah. Everybody the expected race. them to win. Everyone had huge expectations that Ferrari were going to come in and absolutely mm. smoke it. Yeah, and and, and Melbourne's a slightly funny race. You know, we shouldn't take it as too indicative of the rest of the season. But that said, it does seem like they clearly weren't as quick this weekend as they were expecting, as Mercedes were expecting. They must be a little concerned that they're not going to be as quick over the season as they'd figured three or four weeks ago. We'll see. And I think Kimmy is probably the one enjoying that most of all, isn't he? I got out of the team at the right time. I'm going to be faster than them in my Alfa Romeo. A truly a silver. And just a few highlights, things to mention over the race. When Ricardo went over that gully in his wing, did you hear the crowd reaction? On screen, it was like they'd ramped up a special effect. Hmm. I'd never heard a mass disappointment on screen Mm. in a race, Mm. during race time, like I heard at that point. Also, (laughs) Vettel, did you see how he got his elbows out for Leclerc in the first couple of corners? He edged Leclerc right out. He's not having it, is he? Ooh, Mm. naughty Vettel. Hard but fair. Hard but fair. The new wings, though, this effect of fewer number of elements on the front plane, which is supposed to allow cars to follow closer to cars, which have now also got a higher rear wing with a greater DRS opening and a wider wing, so there should be a greater difference between when it's closed and open. Didn't make much difference apart from the midfield. There was a few bits going on in the midfield, wasn't there? But there was no real passing and repassing well, in the top three cars. Apparently, Ross Braun said that he saw the signs as encouraging because there were 14 passing moves in the race, six without DRS, compared to three in 2018. Yeah, must well, be so. You've got to it compare I love Melbourne. it when you turn it with stats. <laughs> <This is good. laughs> yeah. You've you got know. to compare with Melbourne last year. You can't compare it with other tracks. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It's a good yeah. point, Zach. Yeah, it's not a very overtakey track. Exactly. Generally, yeah. so, yeah. I'm never going to argue with Ross Braun. Ross Braun <laughs> says in, in that voice. Is absolutely and then he wrong. goes on to say yeah. that apparently. Apparently Max Verstappen quite liked it because he found it easier to overtake. Max Verstappen Vettel. quite liked it, well, he, he found it easier to overtake. But then Lewis Hamilton said he didn't see it as a difference at all. Max took, yeah. took Vettel in some style, didn't he? Somewhere in the middle of the race. That's yeah. quite a nice little move there. Science's Renault engine in the McLaren caught fire and lap 11 pulled into the pit, which made Lando Norris, of course, look even better. But that's no bad thing. Magnussen and Hulk renewed their relationship should we say from last year those two love to hate each other don't they that was elbows out the whole race scrapping there yeah what about the renault honda engine situation if saints renault engine caught on fire after they've just started with renault and now red bull have yeah. they've managed to make a podium with honda yeah honda must be dancing a happy japanese dance what is, is it kabuki 
theatre dancing. What do they call the Japanese dancers? There's not much dancing in Kabuki. It's, isn't there more, it's, it's yeah. almost yeah. kind of mind. Face masks and mind. It just makes me think of there's a trauma yeah. film where Sergeant Kabuki Man NYPD. What? Uh, if you want a bit of sort of good, good trash. <laughs> what are you uh, watching? I've been watching trashy movies. I, I love trauma. Surf Nazis must die. That's Surf Nazis that's, that's, must die. Most that's dinos, most. Maybe karate kid. Anyway, back to F1. Lap 31, Max takes Vettel for third place. Lap 31, Ricardo retires as if it wasn't already bad enough. Mm. Finally out of the race. Lap 35, Roshan retires. To some swearing from Gunther Steiner, I'm sure. Probably. Bottas was then on lap 47, 25 seconds ahead of Lewis, and he hears from his engineer, the only way we can lose this race is by not having rubber or a safety car. And this was, I think... For a safety car, I think you said. Is that right, for a safety car. And then this was Bottas's most restrained moment of Sisu ever. All he said was, copy. That's all you're getting from him, copy. Very under control. And then he went on to talk about wanting the fastest lap, didn't he? Now let's talk about well, the fastest, yeah, lap. He had fastest Leclerc, lap. Here it comes. Yeah, he and Leclerc traded it a couple of times, didn't they? They all tried. <laughs> Max Verstappen was going gung-ho. He really wanted that extra point. But then Valtteri Bottas over Team Radio said, no, 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 I want the 26 points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's 21 points over a season. They make yeah. a big difference, you well, know? He's, he's yeah. Now he's been the highest, what is it? The well, yeah, He has the greatest points lead yeah. after the first race that any driver has ever held. Because of that. Because <laughs> we've never had uh, a point for the fastest lap in the period when we've had so many points for first place. So we'll, we'll have I more from our ultimately it, meaningless statistics desk. Maybe about <laughs> sitting, maybe. Hold on, one at a time, one at a time. So what were you just saying? No, it's a bit, hey, it's a record. Good I missed what you were saying because oh, I was listening I, to three I, people. I thought Ferrari were going to pit Charles Leclerc so he could change tyres and then go for the fastest lap. Was that what I heard? Was I it that Max Verstappen? I didn't notice that, if that was yeah. the case. So mm. There was chat about someone pitting, changing tyres. If you were far enough back in the field, you might think about doing that. But, but I you think only get that you're... fastest lap point if you're in the top ten. So yeah. if you're oh, bumping around the back, it's, it's exactly no use. It. Yeah, that's but that's good. the thing. I suppose if you're within the top ten, you'd have to have such a gap to the person yeah, behind you. I think you. Yeah. there was a big enough gap. My you're never going to do that. So that would work out, but it's always still a gamble. What if they messed up the pit stop? Oh, no. You lose a place or more, you've lost mm. more than one point. So it's an interesting one. I they, like they it. They have it's thought this through as a rule. They have, unusually. Yeah, you know what? And actually it did make good. the end of the race just that little bit more exciting. A bit of extra yeah. level yeah. of yeah. colour. Yeah. You did a bit of research into this, didn't you, about uh-huh. how it would have changed. Sarah, bless her, she's good with figures. Is how, if you're in the top ten and get the fastest lap, how it would have changed the results last year and when it would have made a significant difference. Oh. What year? Go on, Sarah, tell us okay. the maths of this. Okay. Okay, so in last year's Formula One season, Valtteri Bottas would have picked up an extra seven points. He got right. fastest laps seven times in the top ten. Daniel Ricciardo, he would have picked up an extra four points. Lewis Hamilton, an extra three points. Sebastian Vettel, three points. Max Verstappen, two points. Kimi Raikkonen, one. And Kevin Magnussen, one. So it wouldn't have changed the overall results, although Bottas would have come up to third place and Raikkonen would have gone up an extra place and so would have Verstappen. So it would have changed the ranking. It would have changed the ranking. That's significant in itself. If we can go back to 2008, it would have made Felipe Massa champion rather than and Lewis Hamilton, who wow. famously pipped the Brazilian at the last corner of the final race and won the title by a single point. Oh. Mind you, so. you have to wonder whether if that point was in play, would drivers then have tried to get the, the I fastest see. lap away? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah. the, the striking there. thing when, yeah. you read the, when you read the, that point, list see. for last year is that it's striking that Hamilton would have only had three points for the fastest mm. lap, whereas Bottas was eight, you said? That is way out of whack with their finishing results. Well, I think teams and drivers would have Approach the season differently had sure. those rules been in place at the beginning of the season. It's all his. Yeah, it would affect the outcomes. It did add another level of interest to it. I mm. was always very cynical well, about it. What's the point? But having seen it in play. It's definitely adding something. Particularly as towards the end of the race, you know, you're quite often in a situation where it's you know who's going to win the race. Mm. But the, for those last few laps, you now don't know who's going to get fastest lap. So mm. there's something significant in play there. The fastest lap reminds me of the way they do the bonus point in rugby, just to make the game more exciting. So even though I don't know, a rugby team might be winning by X amount of points, they'll still try and get that extra try to get the bonus point to go towards, I don't know, the Grand Slam. 
So, yeah, I like it. It's good. <laughs> the, the fastest lap is like a conversion in rugby. I like that as an idea. But speaking of innovations or new things this year, one thing that's new, this isn't in the rules, this is on the TV coverage, the graphics side, that I'm not loving or I'm not understanding is the thing that pops up on the bottom of the screen from time to time saying chance of Gasly overtaking 38%. Oh, and I didn't see that. that. They see that this, this remarkably precise... Really? Uh, value for the chance of wow. somebody make, you know, overtaking the driver in front of them. How are they working that exactly, out? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Gasly just... obviously didn't take his chance. No, absolutely not. <laughs> not got that one wrong, but, um, <laughs> but that just looks like nonsense to me. How are you figuring that number out? I'd love to know mm. how they calculate it. Yeah, look after it in the next race. See yeah. what... I think they're using AI, Zog, to work that out. They've been talking Sorry. about introducing AI into... F1 this year to make those calculations so it's going to be based on the gap to the car in front his performance previously just every bit of data that they can get and okay. it's coming yeah, with it themselves say, yeah, I'm sure you could have some kind of machine learning algorithm figure out a percentage there we go we've got Bottas leading the championship for how long? Is he going to win the next race? Where are we next? Bahrain? No? Mm-hmm. Yeah? I don't know. Uh, no, I think Lewis probably. I mean, like I say, I'm convinced Lewis is still clearly the better driver. It's going to take another couple of results of like that before I start to seriously question whether Bottas has made... Uh, no, Lewis is clearly the better driver. Come on. Tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, but it'd be nice if newly... Oh, I can have steak and chips. Bottas... <laughs> Could mm. close the gap to Hamilton, who we know is yes, superb, but just a bit more. Or the Ferraris to pull the socks up a bit more and be more of a convincing thing, which we, they yes. might well do. Yes. It's only been one race. Be great. I think that's where the stories will come out. We, it's clear that Mercedes have the fastest car, but what's going to happen to Ferrari, Red Bull? How will the stories play out with all the middle sector, the mid grid? The mid grid. <laughs> the mid grid, yes. Uh, will Daniel Ricciardo actually complete a race this week? Well, well we that's, I mean, because he had fingers a, crossed. A, 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 his luck last season was pretty lousy, wasn't it? And it's Quite it feels like he needs more luck. And we should just say, we're runner. talking about, you know, relative performances and how people have done compared to teammates. Credit to Stroll, he beat Perez fair and square. Have you got the final results of the race? I your, have. On I, your sheaf of facts. I have a sheaf of facts here. It goes like this. Do you want it from back to front or front to back? No, no, I just don't want to see where Stroll came relative to Perez. Stroll, oh, he was... He no, finished, he's in yeah. the points, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just had a really pleased with himself. Really pleased. Yeah, and Paris was 13th. So, yeah. fair enough. Shame Norris down to 12th from a. a was it 8th or 9th? 8th on the grid. Pierre yeah. Gasly, yeah. I must say. It's a, Red Bull would have to be disappointed with Pierre Gasly, do you think? Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. yeah. He qualified 17th and he didn't even make one overtake. He was chasing the Toro Rosso, Kvyat in the Toro Rosso for a large mm. part of the race. And you don't really want the Toro Rosso yeah. to be ahead Junior of the Red Bull. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows, he may have been carrying an issue. We don't know the full story. But he's not living up to the kind of pre-season hype, for sure. Yeah. Also, something that's just worth noting is that last year the Sauber was not amazing. I don't know if this year that Alfa Romeo, as we're now pretending it is, is better, but Raikkonen hauled it in in eighth. Yeah. So which is that? Is the car better or is that just his sheer determination? Oh, apparently the team are really excited to be working with him. They're really impressed by his commitment. I think it could be a bit of Kimmy there. Yeah, Yeah. Oh, definitely there's got to be. I mean, he does the thing. It's just when he can be bothered, he's really, really good. I quite like Kimmy. Oh, yeah, well, when he's bothered and when when he's got a good car under him, there's a real difference between Kimmy in a car that he feels he can do something in and Kimmy in a bad car. He will not bother if the car is is left. And now in this season, you get to hear from Kimmy a lot more because Ferrari controlled what their drivers did after the race very carefully. But in well, we can hear the avalanche of words from well, Kimi Raikkonen. I kid you not. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> the, the directors in their ear going, "Time to shut up." Time to shut up. It, it no, he's actually happened. They did a walkie talk with Kimi, and Kimi was the most verbose wow. I have ever, 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 ever heard. I kid you not. A it's... whole three sentences. <laughs> <laughs> One of them made sense. <laughs> I'm just having a quick scout through before we wrap this up. Yeah. But yeah. There's a lot of people here who you go, "Ooh, did well." Magnussen in sixth in that yeah. pass. Mm. Yeah, Titan not just good at putting up shells. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Hulkenberg in seventh in the Renault. You know, it's sort of there's an interesting one. There's sort of a lot of overperformers and underperformers based on what you think would go on. Yeah, mm. and the number one underperformer, truth be told, is I know it's fourth place, which is still not bad, but Sebastian Vettel. Yeah, eh, that probably should have been. Third, shouldn't it? But because hey, you have no problems with this car in the way, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. It doesn't, well, doesn't, just yeah. the problem is it's obviously not quite. He com- well, he complained about how slow the car was. Apparently, he said on the team radio, How come the car is so slow? Mm. Why are we so slow? But he yeah. was still at that point, I think, in like fourth or fifth, wasn't he? So it's like everyone's going, Oh my god, Ferrari crisis, crisis. And it's like, Well, no, they were fourth and fifth, it's not the end of the world yet. That's it's just not, that but race, it's not yet. but, it's but not how they'd like to you do sort of think Vettel, mm, he probably should have been on the podium if he wants to really sort of make a ballsy, confident start to the season. I suppose Ferrari under 
performed with the way they went compared to testing. Mm, that's the thing. Everyone Absolutely. had them at the great expectations. True enough. And Mercedes, you know, we were joking about the bagging of the sand during testing. Mm. I think maybe there was a little sand bagulation. But in a while, I think, didn't they say that they didn't quite understand why they were so quick this weekend? It seemed like the right. car was a little bit trickier than they'd expected it. And maybe the data-driven was... world of Formula One, I don't believe a team that goes, we don't understand why this is happening. <laughs> I mean, if they don't understand uh, at the weekend, it's now... Now, the week after, I bet they do understand now. They'll have been crunching numbers in the understanding department. And on that note, just finally, obviously a dismal weekend for Williams and bumping along at the back and coming in last. But they say they found a big flaw with the car that they could fix. It was called Paddy well, Low, I think, wasn't it? Oh! Let's, let's have a try. <laughs> mm, I don't know. Well, that, it was. Right? Okay. Well, anyway. Mm, but hey, look out for them fixing that. They're just yeah. like, oh, oh, the switch was in the down position. Right. <laughs> just need to put, bingo. Right. It's oh, working pole. Now. Oh, we got pole. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm going to leave us with these two final thoughts. First of all, the didgeridoo. Did you hear uh, the didgeridoo? I did. Yeah, I was kind of cringing. <laughs> I was great in the garage it when they did. It was good. It was good. I was hilarious. I'm I'm wondering what they're going to have in the British Grand Prix. Silverstone, what is the traditional well, instrument yeah, of Northampton? Who are, the, who are the native people of Britain? Uh, well, the Welsh. <laughs> yes, that's us. I'll be in there playing a coracle. It's not an instrument, is it? No. And second of all, the best moment of the whole weekend was Bottas's response to Mark Webber's question, what do you have for breakfast this morning? Porridge. Absolutely deadpan. Love it. And I've been having porridge for breakfast ever since. It's made me no quicker. You've been listening to Zog. Goodbye. To Sarah. Goodbye. To Richard. Goodbye. I was Gareth, and as this is the show that wraps up the first race of the season, we're going to play out with our usual song for the first race of the season, which is F1's Back 2019. And this year, it's an acoustic version. See ya. One's back for 2019 It'll be the closest season that we've ever seen That's what they tell us but it remains to be seen Especially as it isn't on your free to wear screens Bot has got off to a pretty good start And even took an extra point at Albert Park Ferrari were off the pace And equally sadly Looks like Williams are gonna do badly Ted's midweek tech report will be enlightening But you know what struck us like a bolt of lightning Our life is fragile and it's a little bit frightening That we have to end this song this year With our I be Charlie Whiting To send us an email, see pictures, get song lyrics, join our Facebook fan site, follow us on Twitter, or to find out about sponsorship opportunities, go to garethjones.tv. Gareth Jones on Speed is made in London by Whizbang. Gareth Jones on Speed!